of the areas around Kingsdown that I've investigated at various times during my life. The remains of Sandown Castle at the north end of Deal remains one of my favourite places. Even though all that remains of the area where the castle once stood is the northeast and west towers, now demolished, and their position marked out with boulders and paths across the site, the sea has taken the rest. In 1539, Henry VIII issued his instructions for the defence of the realm in time of invasion and ordered the construction of forts along the English coastline. Sandown, Deal and warmer castles were constructed along with four earthwork forts known as the Great Turf Bulwark, the Little Turf Bulwark, the Great White Bulwark and the Warmer Bulwark. And a two and a half mile long defensive ditch and bank to protect the Downs Anchorage and Deal Beach on which enemy soldiers could easily be landed. Sandown Castle was built between April 1539 and the autumn of 1540. It was nearly identical to its sister castle at Walmer, with a tall keep 83 feet across at the centre, flanked by four rounded bastions and a moat, which was surrounded in turn by a curtain wall. The walls of the castle were 15 feet thick, with the embrasures in the walls splayed for the guns to traverse widely, and above were vents to allow the smoke from the black powder to escape. The defences comprised three tiers of artillery, giving a total of 39 firing positions, with an additional 31 gun loops in the basement or rounds. It was initially garrisoned by a captain, two lieutenants, two porters, ten gunners and three soldiers. In 1573 the three castle of the Downs were honoured by the presence of Queen Elizabeth, who inspected them on her route from Dover to Sandwich, and the night of the 30th of August was according to tradition, spent at Sandown Castle. A survey of 1616 reports that a range of repairs were needed, including a new drawbridge and repairs to the walls that the sea was battering, at an estimated total cost of £437. In 1634 this had risen to £1,243, and a report from 1641 suggested that £8,000 of investment was required in the three castles of the Downs, including £3,000 for additional sea defences. In 1642, during the First English Civil War, Sandown Castle was taken and held by parliamentary forces. When the Second Civil War broke out in 1648, Sandown Castle was declared for the King, followed shortly afterwards by the garrisons at Deal and Walmer. Following the parliamentary victory at the Battle of Maidstone at the start of June, Colonel Nathaniel Rich and his forces were sent to capture the Downs castles. Warmer Castle was the first to be besieged and surrendered on the 12th of July. An earthwork fort was constructed between Sandown and Deal castles, and Deal was then attacked in late July. Royalist forces mounted an attack from the sea to relieve Deal on the 10th of August, with a second attempt on the 15th of August, which involved a landing of 750 men supported by 50 soldiers from Sandown. Neither operation was successful. Deal surrendered on the 20th of August, and artillery assaults then began on Sandown, which now, completely isolated, surrendered on the 5th of September. In 1649, Parliament ordered that supplies of ammunition and powder be sent to Sandown and other castles in the Downs. New earthworks were erected during the interregnum between Sandown and Deal to address the threat of Dutch attack. The garrison at Sandown is given at this time as a governor and 21 soldiers, but at the restoration of Charles II in 1660, this was reduced to a captain and 18 men. Sandown Castle achieved some notoriety when, after the restoration of Charles II, it served as the prison of Colonel Hutchinson, one of the signatories of the death warrant of Charles I. A warrant for his transportation to the Isle of Man was prepared in April 1664, but instead he was transferred to Sandown Castle in Kent on the 3rd of May, 
His wife, Lucy Hutchinson, wrote that. When he came to the castle, he found it a lamentable old ruined place, almost a mile distant from the town, the rooms all out of repair, not weather free, no kind of accommodation either for lodging or diet, or any conveniency of life. Before he came, there were not above half a dozen soldiers in it, and a poor lieutenant with his wife and children, and two or three cannoniers, and a few guns almost dismounted, upon rotten carriages. But at the colonel's coming thither, a company of footmore was sent from Dover to help guard the place. Pitiful weak fellows, half starved and eaten up with vermin, whom the governor of Dover cheated of half their pay, and the other half they spent in drink. These had no beds, but a nasty court of guard, where a sutler lived, within a partition made of boards, with his wife and family. And this was all the accommodation the colonel had for his victuals, which were bought at a dear rate at the town, and most horribly dressed at the sutler's. For beds he was forced to send to an inn in the town, and at a most unconscionable rate hire three, for himself, and his man, and Captain Gregory and to get his chamber glazed, which was a thoroughfare room, that had five doors in it, and one of them opened upon a platform, that had nothing but the bleak air of the sea, which every tide washed the foot of the castle walls. Which air made the chamber so unwholesome and damp, that even in the summer time the colonel's hat case and trunks, and everything of leather, would be every day all covered over with mould. Wipe them as clean as you could one morning, by the next they would mouldy again and though the walls were four yards thick, yet it rained and threw cracks in them. And then one might sweep a peck of saltpetre off of them every day, which stood in a perpetual sweat upon them. The castle was indeed ruinous and unhealthy, and Colonel Sir John Hutchinson died on September 11, 1664. It is said of a fever after drinking wine in his prison cell with two gentlemen. The two gentlemen mentioned aforesaid also died within two months themselves. Lady Lucy obtained permission to bury his body at the family estate at Althorpe in Nottinghamshire. He was duly buried in St Margaret's churchyard and there is a memorial to his memory in the church. In the revolution of 1688 against James II, the townsfolk of Deal seized Sandown Castle on behalf of William the Prince of Orange, later William III. But Sandown was losing the battle with the sea which finally broke through the curtain wall and entered the moat in 1785. The castle was soon after declared unfit for habitation. But it was repaired and garrisoned during the Napoleonic invasion scares, with two new artillery batteries being constructed to the north of the castle. And early in the 19th century the castle was used by the Coast Guard for the suppression of local smuggling, for which Deal had always been notorious. An attempt to save the castle in 1856 came to nothing, as the coastal erosion in the North Deal area continued to take away the land. The War Office sold off some of the reusable materials of the fortification for £564 in 1863 and demolished the upper parts of the castle, leaving a level platform across the lower parts of the keep and the bastions. Part of the stone from this was purchased by the Earl of Granville and used in his rebuilding work at Walmer Castle, while other masonry was reused in the construction of Deal Pier. In 1882, the Royal Engineers used explosives to remove about 600 tons of masonry from the castle for use in the construction of an officer's house at Dover Castle. In 1894, the Royal Engineers again blew up the castle, this time the bastions and the keep on the seaward side using gun cotton. The town of Deal then bought the remains from the government for £35, and in the 1960s, the remaining parts of the castle had been absorbed into the North Deal Sea defences. Between 1988 and 1989, the sea defences were further strengthened in the North Deal area, and the two remaining northwest and southwest bastions that formed in part the sea defences 
were briefly exposed from the shingle bank by the diggers. At the time, I was working with the Kent Archaeological Rescue Unit and engaged in a watching brief to record any surviving archaeology at the castle before its ultimate disappearance. As the diggers got through the shingle banks, the lower story of the northwest bastion came into view, as did one embrasure, which we managed to wiggle through and into the interior of the castle. The passageway ran for a short distance in either direction, but was blocked off by the concrete of the earlier defensive work. But in truth, it was mostly dark, and there was little of importance to see there. Although remaining vulnerable to further coastal erosion, the remains of the castle, now with the parts exposed to the sea encased in a substantial concrete wall, and the areas slightly inland under a shingle bank, with the position of the remaining bastions marked by concrete slabs, is protected as a scheduled ancient monument.